Good, Good morning. Uh, we're going to get started now, and it's my pleasure to present to you the uh, lady I call my boss. She's the dean of the School of International and Public Affairs, uh, and I, I think she is absolutely terrific. Uh, dean Chano. And she, incidentally, let me apologize for her. She has a, a, a pre prearranged event, and she's got to get to a conference call in minutes. Or fortunately, her office is right downstairs. Otherwise, she would be here to hear the pearls of wisdom that will spring forth from uh, Mrs. Diallo and from Norman Siegel and the governor. Please. Well, good morning. I'm just here uh, with great pleasure to welcome you to today's uh, gathering. I'm really very happy that we are having this conference and conversation at the School of International and Public Affairs. I'd like to recognize our partner in co-sponsoring today's event on police and community relations, the Amadou Diallo Foundation and its president, Mrs. Diallo. Thank you for being with us. Uh, we really have a number of distinguished people joining us today, uh, including our own beloved Mayor Dinkins, the Foundation Board Chair, and Professor of Practice here at SEPA, the Honorable Eric Adams, the Brooklyn Borough President, the Honorable David Patterson, who is an ADF Board Member, Mr. Norman Siegel, ADF Board Member, Mr. Graham Witherspoon, uh, ADF Board Member. So thank you all very much for joining us. We're here to discuss a subject of great importance uh, to our community and indeed uh, to communities across the United States, police community relations. We've seen a number of incidents this year in New York and across the nation that have thrust this subject of police community relations into the national spotlight and prompted serious discussion and debate on our campus and across our country. It's a discussion we want to have here at SEPA and at Columbia University, and we are honored to host today's gathering. At SEPA, we launched this year a Dean Seminar Series on Race and Policy that is bringing really world-renowned scholars and experts to our campus to discuss challenges related to race and public policy and social justice. We had our first such conversation in this room uh, just a week ago with our own Professor Patricia Williams from Columbia Law School. And soon we will have Ben Jealous and later in the spring, Henry Louis Gates. And with input from our students, we are expanding our course offerings that focus on race and policy here at SEPA. We are strengthening the work of our diversity task force established last spring and um, we're really very pleased to be welcoming all of you here today. Uh, it's an opportunity for us to hear from you, and I hope that we will have many students participating as well. Thank you very much for being with us. I hope you have a productive and engaging day with us, and very much welcome. Thank you. We're gonna get underway our our keynoter is uh, en route, due, due to be here uh, any minute. And uh, I thought we might get started. Uh, on behalf of the Board of Directors of the Amadou Diallo Foundation, I thank you all for being here this morning. And I add the warm welcome of the board to our elected officials, members of the clergy, community leaders, and friends. I'm pleased that uh, there are some students among you because these young people really constitute our future. Here comes a distinguished borough president now. He, he's always been distinguished. Now he's borough president. <laughs> Hi, Eric. How are you? <laughs> you, you do have time. Just <laughs> sit, sit down and relax and, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll be with you shortly. The Amadou Diallo Foundation, which I am privileged to serve as chairman, was established in 1999 by its president, 
Madam Cadiato Diallo, uh, to diminish racial conflict and foster greater respect for differences among people. Uh, I'm sure it, it, no, no one in this audience uh, will forget the quiet dignity that she demonstrated uh, having lost a son under horrendous circumstances. You, as you will recall, he had no weapon, didn't appear to have any weapon, and uh, 41 rounds were fired, 19 of which hit him in the vestibule of the building where he lived. And her, her quiet dignity uh, led uh, many of us to, to follow uh, Al Sharpton, who uh, and a lot of us got arrested at one police plaza. There were a lot of ladies out there in fur coats and heels walking across that bridge. Uh, and uh, I recall uh, on being arrested, there was Charlie Rangel and Al Sharpton and a few of us. And <clears throat> the police were very, very cordial, very nice. They said, well, Mayor, we'll take you out the back. And we said, no, man, don't you understand? That's the whole reason for being here. <laughs> and so we, we, we came out the front. And, uh, but it was Mrs. Diallo, really, who uh, was, uh, I mean, any of us, any parent here knows what it is. Uh, I can imagine what it would be to lose a child. And uh, she, she's just amazing. Um, and it's because of her and my buddy uh, Norm Siegel that we, we came together um, and, uh, and, and the work continues. In February of 2005, the foundation created the Amadou Diallo Scholarships to help bring Amadou's dream of an American college education into closer reach for students of African descent throughout the diaspora. With the number of fatal confrontations between law enforcement and young men of color in our communities around the country and right here at home, seemingly on the rise, it appeared appropriate that the Amadou Foundation spearhead a solutions-based dialogue as we work to improve police and community relations and help clear the vision of those who view the world through a cloud of racism and intolerance. It's no coincidence that this event was scheduled 16 years to the day that young Amadou was violently taken from his family by four police officers who fired a combined total of 41 shots, 19 of which struck and killed him in the vestibule of his own apartment building in the Bronx. It's important to Amadou's family and the foundation's board members that we all share a common purpose, a purpose that moves us beyond the shared pain and bitterness over the years since his death. It is also important that we uncover ways to build the trust between our community and law enforcement. Uh, I would ask Mrs. Diallo to come forth now uh, if you're ready if you're not ready, come anyhow. <laughs> and I mean, uh, I mean, this is, uh, you know, I do not exaggerate. Do I? I don't exaggerate. This, this lady has this, this calm demeanor. Uh, she, she rallied many of us to her side, recognizing that, that there had to be an answer to the problems that we face. And so it's my pleasure to present to you our leader, Mrs. Katio Diallo. And you, you're gonna, you're gonna you. Wow. Uh, good morning to you. Good morning. I thank you so much for taking your time and coming here today to be with us during this very important event. I want especially to thank the Dean of SEPA for being here to introduce our Chairman, Mayor David Dinkins. 
I want to thank Mayor Dinkins for giving us the blessings and giving us the wisdom so that we can carry on. Thank you very much. It was 16 years ago when I came to America, not my first time, but it was a different trip. I had to come across the ocean to come and make sense of, out of this senseless killing of my son, Amadou. During my trip, I thought I was coming because of my lost, me, the mom. But when I came to New York, I realized that this loss was for all people. Because when I came, everyone rallied together, all different races, religion, ethnicity. Everyone was standing in one voice to say that this must have never happened. We need to do something so we can stop this. This is why I realized that my life then, when, that I knew then, has changed and will never be the same. Because the community embraced me, and I embraced the community, and I realized this is my family. Thank you so much, New York City. Thank you so much for America for wiping my tears and letting me know that in despair and agony, you cannot dwell in, in, in the pain. You cannot be bitter. I thank God for my faith to continue to live through this and wake up every day and do something that I believe is positive. Um, the Amadou Diallo Foundation was formed in the purpose of carrying up Amadou legacy, his short life, 23 years, cut short without any explanation, any preparation, then we can carry that legacy forward so that young generation to come will also learn through this legacy, will do changes that needed to make our society, the imperfection of our society, to be perfect. It's not easy, but we must go on. We must make everything we can together, work together to bring positive changes. I thank Norman Siegel. Since day one, we were together. We marched, we protested. Reverend Sharpton organized rallies and prayers. All the clergy, all the community leaders, parents, children came together and said, this is wrong. We are not anti-police. This is why we have to work through the foundation to make people understand that we are for unity. We are for common purpose so that we can perfect our family, as I said. We cannot live without law enforcement. We need them. We need them to keep the peace. We need them to help us and save our children. I have one mom here, Hawaba. She came to New York under different circumstances, but the same ending of the tragic death of her son. Many other families went through the same thing. So today, 16 years later, we are here to do not grieving, not passion, but compassion. We are here to come and find common solutions, bring the conversation to the platform, and find out a way in which we can contribute to help the city heal, to help for justice, to help for unity. Thank you, Eric Adam. Um, I remember you and Grand Wetherspoon, when my son was killed, 
You were the ones who was going in the neighborhood and telling the children, what do you do when stopped by police? Thank you for your work. Thank you for bringing that kind of education to the youth. Eric Adam, is, uh, um, um, Jean Adam is here from BCC. They, ho they are hosting the Amadou Diallo Scholarship Program. And I have over there Susan Plum from Skadden. Skadden have been very helpful to us. So on behalf of Amadou Diallo Mom, I want to thank the whole board of the Amadou Diallo Foundation for helping us doing the work needed to keep his legacy alive and positive. I can't wait to hear from the expert. I can only speak from the voice of a mother who is trying to bring positive changes. I'm glad that I have a distingu distinguished board members on this Amadou Diallo Foundation board because the work needed to be done is to bring uh, the police community and the community together so that we cannot be two different worlds apart. We have to be together. Unity, again, I have to say unity. Even in time of crisis, if we are united, we can heal, we can move forward. Linda, I thank you so much for organizing this event. We have to give you one round of applause. Yes, it is my honor now to introduce to you our guest speaker. Mr. Eric Adam was a captain in the New NYPD force. And today he's a distingu distinguished leader. He's the president of the Bro Brooklyn Borough. But I know you will go higher. We are proud of you. We are looking forward in seeing the excellence that you will bring to New York and America. It is my honor to introduce you. Please come forward. Thank you so much. Um, I have to be careful what I say, because I see Ozzy's in the audience. <laughs> uh, you know, this is, a <clears throat> this is a, an important uh, moment, and I just want to really thank you, uh, Ms. Diallo. Uh, you experience a Galilee moment uh, to lose your son. But I believe there is a biblical analogy that one can lose a life and give life. And for you to turn your pain into purpose and not say, why was it me, instead of why can't it be me to impact and effect change. We cannot thank you enough for that, and I thank you. And my friend Norman Siegel, who has a countless number of decades of uninterrupted commitment to ensuring that America becomes what it ought to be. I've witnessed uh, Norman life through the civil rights marches of the 60s uh, to representing some of the important figures of his time and just representing everyday New Yorkers. And we cannot say enough about what Norman has committed to the people of the city and the people of this country. Uh, keep doing what you're doing, Mr. Ne Siegel. He knows no other way. <laughs> Norman, Norman wakes up eating and sleeping and drinking. How is he going to start a fight? I call him Mr. Troublemaker. <laughs> You know, and our mayor, uh, the mayor, um, you know, we did not, sometimes you don't realize how blessed you are until you get a Giuliani, you know. <laughs> uh, we were so blessed with the uh, compassionate and commitment and dedication of Mayor Dinkins. Uh, just a class act, just a class act. And uh, I, I appreciate you so much. Uh, you know, I want to just really dive right into our conversation because it has, I, I believe, been uh, mis 
interpreted over the years. And there are, I believe, three phases to addressing this issue. Uh, one, we must have those who agitate, uh, those who negotiate, and those who legislate. And real impactful change won't take place without th those three bodies together. And so we must really commend our young people who p participated in righteous protests and to see them take the streets, the grandchildren of the civil rights movement, allowing them to take the streets, not in the manner that it was carried out in Ferguson, St. Louis, but to do it in a peaceful manner. Because you can't say black lives matter and you shoot off the rooftops at police offices. You can't say black lives matter and you burn down the communities where blacks live. And really the conversation must change and the terminology Shit. can be only, only black lives matter. The, the goal, what people did to stand up was right. you want to you come and share this with me? Come on, come on up and share this with me. No, I want you to come, apologize. Come up and I share this with me. Apologize. You, no, you're not sorry. You're not sorry. You're not sorry. You want to come and share the podium? Do you want to share the podium? Do you want to share the podium? Do you want to share this podium? I am sharing this podium. Well, come and share it with me. I want you to apologize. Uh, no, I... Sir, I am, I am sorry. No, we've had decades of no peace with these police. Sir, I am sorry. I am sorry for you. May, may, may Jenkins, um, can, I'll, I'll continue. I'm used to uh, hecklers, so I'll continue. So what's, what's important... We do not have to live this way. Our police, when we have... Mayor, you can have a seat. Mayor, you can have a seat. And, and so part of, the con part of the conversation, part of the conversation is that we must learn how to disagree without being disagreeable. Right. We must learn, we must learn that there are many, many different people who have, who have the, the belief on what should be done. And I am really sorry for the young man, but please excuse him, because sometimes anger can put us in a place 
where we want to attack those who have a history of addressing police misconduct. And we will never get to the point where we will impact or effect change if we can't sit down and speak to each other. Some of the same things that we accuse police officers from doing across the globe is what we are doing to each other when we don't move towards effective solutions. But the worst thing we could do, I believe, I sent out a tweet last night after I finished meditating. And I said during that tweet that I do not agree with myself 100% of the time. How do I agree with others 100% of the time? My goal is not to always have to agree, but when I disagree, I don't want to be disagreeable. And history has shown us examples of those who come with the energy and the enthusiasm, who point the finger at those who have laid down the legacy of commitment to effecting change. I never have to apologize for my commitment of the people of the city of New York. Not only did I wear a bulletproof vest to protect children and families for 22 years, but while I was in the agency, I fought to impact and effect real change. That takes a lot of tough doing in the process. And I marched with young people as they marched throughout the streets to talk about change. I stood and raised my right hand under oath and testified against Commissioner Kelly when he stated that the reason stop and frisk proliferated our communities was because he wanted to instill fear in young people. I studied and moved up through the ranks, even while being moved to a captain, to a lieutenant, having my car windows shot out and days later taking the exam. Countless number of times for 22 years coming to my lockers and seeing rats placed on them sitting outside learning how to sleep with sand next to my bed so I can put out the fire if someone threw a Molotov cocktail through the windows, dealing with the threats of what took place over the years. I am not going to relinquish my ability and desire for people of goodwill to sit down and talk no matter how people interrupt my conversation because being loud can't make you proud. You have to be solid in what you do. And so we would keep moving. There's always going to be those who are going to have a different opinion and a different belief. But if we believe we are right, then those who are on one end of the spectrum that believe police officers do nothing wrong at all, and those who are on the other end of the spectrum that believe we have no use for police at all, let them hang out there. I want to be with the middle, moderate, intelligent, intellectual, well thoughtful, thinking people who want to have a city that we can all live together. That's my goal. That's my goal. And I'm going to continue to move towards that. And so I think that when we talk about police community relation. The first order of business is to define the role of the police. The role of the police is to keep order and correct conditions. And sometimes that role is misinterpreted. The goal is to keep order and to correct conditions. And from time to time, often, what we, we, we receive our elementary understanding of policing, we look at CSI Miami. And that's not the reality. You don't solve crimes in, in a 60-minute in a block. There's no great technology that allows someone to move through to find out what took place. Uh, there's no easy way to carry out the job of, of, of policing. So when we focus on those two important actions of keeping order and correcting the condition, I believe that there are three areas of trust. First, we have to supply our officers with the right tools. What am I saying by the right tools? When you supply someone with the right tools, they also must use the tools that they are supplied with. What you are finding across America, not only in New York City, which is the largest, largest police department, 
uh, in the country, but across America, officers leave their particular precinct or commands. They exit their commands with a toolbox full of tools to correct the condition. But what you're finding in communities of color or in economically challenging communities, the only tool that's used is the hammer. In other communities, you utilize every tool in the toolbox. Look at Eric Gardner for a moment. There was enough time to talk and conversate with Eric Gardner to de-escalate the situation, to use conflict resolution skills, to use other non-lethal forms. But immediately after a simple conversation, the officers went and used the hammer. But when you go to various parts of the city on Park Avenue in Manhattan, you should use the same tools in Park Place in Brooklyn. You should use the tools of talking to individuals and finding the capacity to de-escalate the situation so that you can ensure, one, that the public isn't harmed in any way, two, that the officers are not harmed, and three, believe it or not, that the person that you're trying to correct the condition is not harmed. The goal is to ensure that you use the tools that are necessary to correct the condition without harming anyone that's involved. If you do an analysis of policing, you'll find that it's just the opposite. You go from conversation to escalation to using force without ensuring that every other tool you have is actually used in the process. That is at the cornerstone of what is happening in policing in America. Why does that happen? Because in the New York City police departments and in the police departments across the country, you're not taught in the real life scenario or universe. You are taught in a fairy tale universe. Police departments don't want to deal with the climate that we're recruiting our officers from. We're recruiting our officers from a society that is uh, uh, filled with those who are homophobic, anti-Semitic, racist, uh, people who have violent tendencies, people uh, who uh, don't believe that they should live in a multicultural environment. And far too often, our officers are coming from communities where it's a monolithic community, both black, white, and Asian, and Hispanic, all groups. For the first time, many of our officers are interacting in a multicultural environment is when they put on that blue uniform. Outside of that, they're living in these silos and know little or nothing about policing or even living in a multicultural environment. And so they are forced to move into a multicultural environment and they're given the power of taking away not only life, but taking away freedom. And so if the police department and our police agencies fail to train and deal with those real impressions and deal with the real stereotypes that we have, then you're not going to effectively address the issue. What does that mean? It means acknowledging that when I see you, I see white. When I see you, I see black. When I see you, I see a Muslim woman. It means acknowledging what I see and what do I feel when I see that? And what predispositions I have that I'm bringing into this profession called policing. But if you are training people to ignore that and say we don't see color and we don't see race and we don't see ethnicity, then really we are not policing in a very real universal environment. Acknowledge what we see acknowledge what predispositions we bring, and that gives us the great tools to ensure that we can police correctly in those environments. How do you use those tools? Don't tell me that after September 11, that police officers were not being overly aggressive to people of the Muslim community. Don't tell me that. I met with a group of Muslim officers who came to sit down with me when I was going through executive protection training, and they came to me with tears in their eyes while they were standing and protecting various locations throughout the, to the city to make sure the city was safe. Their loved ones were being attacked mainly because they wore a hijab or because they lived in certain parts of the community. 
unwilling to protect their own family members because of what was happening at our center of trade. And the anti-Muslim sentiment and feeling that grew out of that moment is, a, is still moving through our city and our country today. So if our officers are taking the pain that they have without going through some therapeutic assistance to address that pain, it's going to play out on the streets. So our role as government, our role as trainers, is to arm the officers with the tools they need. What other tools do they need? Technology must catch up with policing. To not have cameras on patrol cars, to not have body cameras, to not have cameras on handguns, with all the technology that's available, if you could have cameras on every cell phone and cameras on every item and every poll, there's no reason that we don't have cameras in our police agencies to use as a method of not only to ensuring that proper police practices were used, but also if something was done incorrectly, a camera and a video footage can teach how to improve training. The mere fact that the police department has failed to introduce cameras into their system is an error on our part. We must have camera and video technology to show what happens. You no longer can create an environment where it's a story of the police against the person that he's having his interaction with. You have to have cameras and technology used in our police department. That is one of the most important things and element of policing uh, that, that we need to introduce. What, what would a camera do? Does it stop abuse? Does it stop a police officer who's doing something wrong? No. It tells the story and allows the tool of the police officer to use that camera to give a true account of what took place and what didn't take place. Second. Community engagement, so important. Young man was just talking about he's tired of some of the things that police officers are doing. I have a fix, become a cop, become a cop. It took my arrest at 15 year old being abused by the hands of the police that I realized the only way you effect change when Herbert Daughtry assembled together 13 young men after the killing of a young man in Brooklyn where the police officer were able to take his life and walk away free and they brought together Herbert Daughtry and G.T. Wayusi and other leaders of that day. I did not want to be a police officer. I was a computer geek. I wanted to just sit behind the terminal and use COBOL and other uh, computer languages of that time. But they said, we cannot continue to complain from outside when we have strong, intelligent, young black men that can go inside the system and impact change. That was the goal. Become a police officer and go inside. Let's recruit young people. Tell them to be part of the police environment. You are not going to live in a society without police officers. And let me tell you something, I don't want to live in a city without police officers. And so if we know that you are going to continue to have over 30,000 men and women wear a police uniform, then why can't those 30,000 men and women be made up of people who understand and grew up in the city of New York? He grew up around the block from Amadou Diallo, and Amadou Diallo lost his life. That should have inspired him to take his initiative into the police department and lead by example of what a police officer ought to be. You can't only throw rocks at the outside. You have to come inside and participate and effectuate change. That is how change is done. Become a cop. Become a cop. Talk to some of the young people in your neighborhood. Talk to them. And you know your, your young people. You know who is intelligent and disciplined enough to become part of the police department. Recruit them. Walk around with applications. Tell them, I saw you grow up for years. I know how inspiring you are. I know how much you're committed to the community. Have them come into the police department and move and be a part of the change that's taking place. Address criminal issues in our communities. Many people don't want to talk about this conversation, but it's a real conversation. And we have to have these difficult conversations. 
The overproliferations of handguns and violence in our community is playing into this sense of disorder. And one thing I, I enjoy more important than anything, when I moved to Brooklyn, 425 Prospect Place, the day I moved in, there was a homicide on the block. The young people were being harassed all the time by the police. My goal was to make sure we didn't need a police officer on the block. So we organized the block. We started doing tenant, patro tenant patrols. We pulled together a meeting where we had 100 people in the meeting. And we stated that we don't want police interacting, doing stop and frisk in our community. This was, this was at the height of stop and frisk. We call it the Gi Giuliani era, where it started from, under Commissioner Safer. And we recruited young, uh, young people, and 100 people came to the meeting. Mayor Dinkins, they all came out and sat out. And the first day we started to do the street, street patrol. Three seniors showed up. 97 people stayed home. Everybody talked about what they wanted to do, but when it was time to hit the streets and make our community safe, they weren't there. But we, we walked anyway. And from each day, we went out and we walked and we provided safety, and a month went by, and then 15 people came out, and another 20 came out, and by the time came 425 Prospect Place and Prospect Avenue between Grand and Clawson Avenue became one of the safest communities in our, in, on, on, in our neighborhood. And we didn't need the police on our block because we protected our own community and sent the message that we wanted our community to be safe. We met the people where they were and took them where they ought to be. We didn't complain about the 97 that stayed home. We said that we will leave you there and you will come out when you realize that you can be empowered to protect your community. So let's de-escalate the violence to the point that we don't need police on our block. And we can't ignore the disorder and the violence that's pervasive in our communities that have continually grown year after year. I don't get any uh, consolation because Diallo was killed by 43 shots or 43 innocent children are being killed by senseless violence. This is a real issue. The same day that young Akai was killed in the pink houses, his, a young man in that community shot his nine-month-old child. So you can't have selective outrage of violence. Black Lives Matter, then it matters if the gun was killed by a person in a blue uniform or blue jeans. Black Lives Matter. And that's a hashtag. Black Lives Matter. All lives matter. That's the, the tone that I believe. One of the most important aspects of this, got to have faith in the system. We must dismantle the grand jury system. You can't continue to have a system that goes behind closed doors to address public issues. You can't continue to do that. Grand juries find it easy to indict Bob who robs a liquor store, but it is challenging to indict the cop who took the life of an innocent person. The grand jury system and the archaic model that came out of England, there are no more kings and queens harming people when they indict individuals. There's no reason we still have this system. And we must move forward to remove the grand jury system. And Governor Cuomo has made an indication that he's going to do that. I don't have much faith in Albany, but I have faith in the people in the city of New York to compel them to look at the grand jury system. Number two, special prosecutor. To deal with any issue or incident where a person is seriously injured by a police officer or a person loses his or her life, we must have a prosecutor that will go in and conduct the investigation and, if need be, the prosecution. But there's something else that needs to be done that a lot of people miss. We must have an independent evidence gathering unit that will go in and collect the evidence when there's an incident between police 
and a civilian person, and a person is seriously injured or loses his life. What does that mean? Right now, if the police de department has a shooting, that's questionable. An officer from the police department goes in to gather that evidence. That crime scene is the picture that can never change throughout the process. If you don't have a crime scene that has not been damaged, tampered with, or any way corrupted, then you cannot have a successful investigation because it won't give you the correct picture. So by having an independent body to go in, gather the evidence, take the photographs, Graham Witherspoon in the Ahmed Diallo shooting found two additional bullet holes that no one else was able to find. And so you can't have sloppy investigations at the preliminary stage before it starts the entire investigation. Remember, because police officers are assigned to different units, don't mean they don't know each other. Don't mean they don't still go to the same bowling alley in the same baseball game and share the same beer. And so the only way you ensure the integrity of the process is to allow an outside body come in, conduct the investigation, then that, that evidence is available for all investigatory agencies that are involved to conduct the investigation. You must have an independent investigator to carry out uh, the process. And, and, and here's, here's something that I sent to uh, the mayor. Change the roles of our police officers. We don't have so much of a crime problem. We have a public relation problem. Our officers must become engaged. My younger brother was a sergeant in the police department, but when he became a police officer, Two days on patrol, he called me. I was studying. It was one of those snowy days, and he, he was in Operation Pressure Point down in Delancey Street. You know, the Delancey Street uh, of today, of that time, didn't have hips, hipsters. You didn't want to live on Delancey Street. And so he called me, and he said, Eric, I can't do this. I'm leaving. He, le he lived a sheltered life, and he was hearing on the radio all the time the shootings, the robberies, and he said, I can't do this. This is difficult for me. And I told him, just give me five days. Just do it for one week, Graham. I told him, just hang in there. And he said, I'm going to try, but you know, I'm really afraid, and I don't want to do this. And so I went, and I met him uh, at Delancey Street. His, his face lit up when he saw me walking down the block. I had a cane because I injured myself. And, and I walked with him on patrol that day. And I spent the entire night walking with him on his beat. And I told him, I said, Bernard, 90% of the people who are out here are happy to see you. Just say hello. Just engage them. Just say good evening. Just say Merry Christmas. Just encounter them. One person may snub you and be rude and disrespectful. Just dismiss them and just deal with the nine. Sometimes we focus on those who do things that harm us and don't realize the overwhelming number of people that embrace us. And he did that. About two weeks later, we ride in through that same area, and he says, Eric, you know, you see these streets? I keep these streets safe, you know? He all of a sudden found his confidence. Many of our officers, if you say hello to them, they're so afraid. They don't realize that we want public safety. And the role of policing must change. It must be retrofitted to today's time. Carry out on patrol the municipal ID forms and hand it out to a person in an immigrant community. Give him, him people information about the pre-K. Talk to people. Walk inside the stores and talk to the store owners and have communications with them. Engage with the public. Allow people to know proactively that you are there and that you want to be part of the community. Policing must change not to be this occupying army that comes in at night and then leaves during the day, but part of the fabric of the community and the overall public safety scheme. And that's how you change the dialogue between police and community. It's not an instant thing. There are years of pain and anger on all sides of this conversation, and the only way you erode it, you erode it by embracing each other in your everyday life. And that is not happening. You can't stand on the street corner waiting for a particular incident to, to happen. 
If the only time people see you is when you are giving them a summons or when you are breaking up a disruption in communication or when you are responding to a crime, then they will have this vision of you that the only purpose you show is when someone is in a state of anger. And it must be more than that. All of those down hours, all of those hours between reporting to job must go proactively to building the trust in the community, and that is not happening. And I encourage the mayor. I stated it's time to take policing into a more, a more kinder and gentler path of how do you communicate with people one-on-one. -on -one. And that's what Norman Siegel and I are attempting to do with our digital conversations. We are finding that young people across the city are living in silos. People don't want to have this honest conversation. We, must, we may share the same train or we may share the same bus, but in all reality, we are going back into our little caves and living there alone. Don't even know each other. Don't even reach a point a path across communities and communicate with, with each other. And that spills into how we police and how, how we interact. Policing is a reflection of a larger problem of a city that has become divided along ethnicity, religion, and race, and gender, and lifestyle. And I say no to that. Let's bring down these walls and start communicating with each other as human beings. We cannot merely blog and tweet and email our despair is a way we have to communicate with each other like human beings again. That's the goal. And that's what you see in our police agencies. You are seeing in our police agencies a reflection of who and what we have become. And so when we start these community dialogues that we are doing throughout the borough and throughout the city, allowing people to talk and have conversations with each other and talk about their misconceptions, Talk about what they perceive. A ask the questions of why was I treated a certain way? Why did an officer walk to my car after a car stop and have his hand on his gun? They're one of the top issues on how police officers uh, lose their lives in policing. Why when he pulled up, up to a domestic violence situation, two cop cars came? Because that is one of the top ways that an officer gets injured at a domestic violence en encounter. Why are we responding a certain way and how do you feel? That's why we did what to do when stopped by the police and Graham and other detectives in the department taught thousands of children of what to do because when you understand each other, you could appreciate each other and you could respect each other and you could ensure that not only do you go home safe, but that officer goes home safe as well. If you take off that blue uniform, you see a person that wants to embrace his wife, his son, his daughter and pay for his mortgage just like you and I do as well. It's all part of the same dream. Don't allow the pain that we're feeling because of the state that we're in to use to be displaced. And that's what happens often. And these conversations that we are attempting to do, I encourage you to do it. Part of the way that we deal with a better police community relation is that we deal with a better people relation. How do we become better human beings? That's my goal. And so I know when you start to walk down this path, there are people who are going to call you sellouts. They're going to call you names. They're going to point finger of blame. But if you are true, if you've taken moments to have periods of reflection, it could be through meditation, as I do, or it could be just periods of just taking time to go inward, people are hurting. Hurt people hurt people. They do mean things. And a lot of the hurt that we are feeling as New Yorkers, we see the police department as a symbol of that hurt. We're hurt because we're losing the housing that we fought so hard to get. We're hurt because of the employment numbers. In Brooklyn, 25% of my borough is living in poverty. Over 50% is one paycheck away. Double digit unemployment in many parts of my community. People are hurting because they're seeing this city leave them behind. People are hurting because they believe government is not responsive to their concern, can't get health care, and the health care you get is inadequate. 
And each time we leave our homes to go to that job we dislike, to see a boss that we hate, to be in a building that we wish we didn't have to go into, we see that guy sitting on the corner with a blue uniform that we just read a story about a young man was shot by one who symbolizes that, we allow our hate to go into that. I'm not going to do that. America and New York is better than what we have experienced in our police departments. And the only way we can turn the corner is that if we expect more, we demand more, we will start to get more. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Good morning. I'm, I'm a, a poor excuse for Governor Patterson, but he's been delayed. We're hoping he still gets here. And in the interest of moving the program forward, because we have such an extraordinary panel this morning, and I know all of you want to engage with our panelists. Uh, I was asked to moderate the panel. I'm uh, Esther Fuchs. I'm a professor here of public affairs and political science. And I have the good fortune of having the office across from Mayor Dinkins. So what could be better than that? I will briefly introduce our panelists to you, but clearly they really need no introduction, and then we will uh, just go right into the panel discussion. On my left is the Honorable Mayor David Dinkins. I don't know what to say about you, Mayor Dinkins, except that you are probably the most extraordinary person I know. Uh, you have given your life to public service and now you inspire students here at SEPA every day. You continue to engage the public discourse in the most important issues facing our city, our nation, and the globe. And uh, I know that you chair the Amadou Diallo Foundation as part of your myriad public service activities. Um, just thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being you. Thank you for being, having been the mayor of our great city. I know you are the mayor of all of the people sitting in this room. And um, your work continues. And we want you to be doing it for a long time to come. We need you. Mrs. Diallo, you too are an inspiration. I, I'm humbled to be here introducing you, um, creating the Amadou Diallo Foundation in memory of your son, but also, as you pointed out, to continue this extraordinary work that we need in our city, also in our nation, also around the globe. Um, I really look forward to your participation on this panel, and I know everybody in this room is really humbled by your presence and um, by the work that you've chosen to do. Thank you. Thank you. Norman Siegel. Norman Siegel, I don't know why I smile when I say your name, but I do. Um, I Norman never sued Siegel you. Is, is, is truly <laughs> one of those amazing New York stories, right? Um, he is now a civil rights and civil liberties 
lawyer, as all of you know, and he ran the American Civil Liberties Union in New York for a long time. I don't think I can associate that organization and its amazing work with anybody but you, and you've continued to be a force for not just social change, but for good in our city, and we truly thank you for that as well. Yeah, yeah. So the one person who's, who I don't know personally and have really never met before, Graham Witherspoon, I, I have no bio for you, oh. um, but I do know about your work in Brooklyn and in the city, your community-based work, and I know most of us in the room know about your work, and you're not somebody who always grabbed a spotlight. You're somebody who just did that hard work on the streets of New York every day, and without you, I think we would be a much poorer city, a much less beautiful city, and we are also blessed to have you here today to share your experiences with us and really guide us to a better future. Thank you so much for being a part of this panel. Thank you. So let's really just get to the work at hand. I'm going to ask Mayor Dinkins to start by talking a little bit about his work when he was mayor of the city of New York and the kinds of challenges, but also the kinds of policies that he put into place uh, to improve community police relations because he really had, I think, a unique approach among mayors, which many across the country have tried to model when he passed his Safe Streets, Safe Cities Act. But he really was an advocate of community policing, and he managed to do extraordinary work in that regard. And I'd love you to talk about that, Mr. Mayor. Uh, after, uh, first of all, thank you for your, your friendship and your help over these many years. Since I lost my other job and got evicted from, from public housing, <laughs> I, I, I came here to Columbia in, in January of 1994 and uh, the person who greeted me the, the most and helped me the most was Dr. Esther Fuchs. She's been terrific. Um, Thank you. Thank you. I, uh, we, when, when we took office, and it is a we, it's a broad we, uh, it's not I. I. I never ever, as I say to a lot of my friends, I never ever thought I was the smartest guy in the room. Uh, but I did have the good fortune of having a lot of very smart women and men. And uh, so it, it made the difference, I believe. And among the things that we thought we had, we knew that we had to do uh, was to attack the, the problems of crime. And you, you will read even today of the crime of the 90s. It's as though on December 31st, 1989, when Ed Koch was mayor, there was no crime. Just the next day on uh, January 1st, 1990, when I took office. Uh, the fact is, it was crime. It was the, the tail end of the crack epidemic. There was crime all over the country. And among the things that we knew we had to do was to provide more police officers, which automatically meant more resources for the related areas. You, if you're going to have more police officers, you, you need more district attorneys, you need more legal aid, we, et cetera, et cetera. And our, our problem, our program was called Safe Streets, Safe City, subtitled Cops and Kids. And uh, that's when the uh, Beacon Schools were born, when we determined that the city could provide the resources and the community would design the programs instead of having the schools just open during the usual hours of instruction. And this worked. So the crime started to go down as early as, as 91. But it wasn't David Dinkins who did it. It was a whole lot of wonderful, bright women and men 
who were committed to bringing down crime in our city. Uh, and so I recall, I don't know what year it was, but not, not when I was mayor, but there was a time when Calvin Butts got braced on 138th Street. Yep. Now that, that's where the Abyssinian Baptist Church is located. Yep. How can a police officer not know Calvin Butts? I mean, it made no sense at all. And so I, I'm suggesting that uh, as Eric Adams, uh, who I thought did a terrific job, uh, part of what's necessary is the community needs to know the police officers and the police officers need to know the community. Uh, I think the average police officer will tell you that many crimes get solved because of the community, because they want to be safe. And, and so it makes a difference. I want to just touch on one thing and I yield to my uh, far more intelligent colleagues here. Some of you may remember, Norman, I know you do, that uh, when the police officers involved in the uh, Amadou shooting, the four of them, uh, they changed the venue. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. Now, uh, I think that was wrong. I think it, it clearly should not have happened. But uh, it ended up in <laughs> Albany County, as I recall. That's correct. And uh, so you get a different r reaction than you would had you had a jury of people from the Bronx. But uh, Nor Norman, uh, I, I throw to you this, this kind of problem. I don't know what it takes to cure that. But I do know that we, we ought not ever permit a circumstance where the people aren't tried by a jury of their peers, not some folks from suburbia. To, to give a little background on that part because it shows the systemic failures of our systems. Uh, on the Friday of the Thanksgiving weekend, uh, where most people are not in town, there's very few courts, uh, there was a motion filed on that Friday morning uh, to move it to Albany. Nobody knew about it. It was done in the appellate division, if I remember correctly. And they moved to Albany County. Uh, I still maintain that if the trial was in Bronx County, we would have had a different result than in Albany. And it's not just an accident. This is part of the intentional systemic institutional problems that we have with these kinds of issues where it's dominated by race. If, if I may add to that, Your Honor, um, the PBA at that time uh, retained, if I remember correctly, Judge, uh, was it Leventhal? I think he had just retired as the Administrative Law Judge of the State of New York. Judge Judy's husband, I may be getting the, wrong, the name wrong, but Judge Judy's husband. Scheidlin. Scheidlin, thank you. Uh, was the administrative law judge. He had just retired. The PBA retained him to facilitate the change of venue. Uh, he filed paperwork to have the case go, I believe, to Westchester County. But they did him even better and sent the case to Albany. Uh, he was financially enhanced uh, for that facilitation. And he and his wife uh, moved to Florida immediately thereafter. So that's some of the background mm. yeah. that you're, you're not going to get from the Daily News that's and the Bert Times. Burt Roberts. Uh, Burt Roberts, that's what yeah. it was. I'm sorry, Burt Roberts. Yeah. Burt, Burt, Roberts. Burt had been, uh, thank you. He, he had been the uh, uh, number one DA in, in New York County and, and then in the Bronx for a while. And it was, he was in private practice at this point. But it was he who, who engineered that. And, and clearly, you, as Norman points out, you got a different result than would have been the result had uh, th those officers been tried in Bronx County. So it's just something that we need to be aware of and mindful of so the next time something comes down the pike that looks at all like that, we, we need to be uh, letting the appellate division, which is where that happens, we need to let them know how we feel about it. 
Before we get deeply into the structural problems in the criminal justice system, which I think the panel is prepared to talk about, I want to engage Mrs. Diallo and ask her to talk a little bit about the work of her foundation and what the foundation is now doing uh, in terms of the kinds of issues uh, that were faced when her son was, was murdered and um, how community organizations can really be helpful in trying to make these changes that we need to see. Thank you so much. Um, the Amadou Diallo Foundation uh, mission is to promote uh, community and police relations, uh, racial healing, um, in, with programs uh, helping um, to address that need. And the second uh, purpose is for this Amadou Diallo Scholarship because one of the things that happened and really um, Trump was very hurtful to me was the headline after Amadou was gone down. Um, back home, I read um, unarmed street peddler was gone down, 41 shot bullet. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I stop and think about that headline the stereotype that was done with my son uh, was unbelievable. Maybe it was as to suggest that this was just an uh, insignificant immigrant who met his destiny on the top street of, of New York, and maybe he couldn't even uh, speak English. The, the picture was totally uh, in, you know, nothing was farther from the truth because Amadou was uh, grew up, born in Liberia, and grew up in Liberia, Togo, and then Asia. So he went to uh, the French International School for his high, high school study in, in Bangkok. After graduating uh, in Bangkok at the Alliance Francaise, he went to Singapore to live with his dad, and he enrolled to take uh, computer classes. He always dreamt of coming to America. He wanted to obtain an American degree mm. here. So this is why we established the Amadou Diallo Scholarship Program because many young immigrant people found themselves here. First of all, they came with a uh, tourist visa and the visa will expire. And sometimes they, they have degree, even up to a master degree, but when they come, they have to have their credit to be taken from back home and translated here and then submitted. Sometimes they have to go back and start from uh, freshmen. So this is the um, program that can help support those immigrant students who as aspire for higher education here in America, especially in New York City. Uh, so I would like people, organizations to really help us support this program because the statistics show that uh, students of African descent have surpassed even uh, American students here. No, this is not to, you know, to suggest that American students are not doing well, but if given opportunity, they can really do well. Amadou never left to, uh, until he will start his, his education he had saved enough money, $9,000 to enroll. Unfortunately, his tragic death you know, took him before he was able to realize that dream. This is a really important point you're making, Mrs. Diallo, of course as it relates to Amadou, but also the general problem of stereotyping and in the minority community and how to turn a victim into someone insignificant so that the public doesn't view the tragedy and the crime as something that needs to be changed as an institutional systemic problem as, as Norman Siegel was talking about earlier. Um, I'm wondering if you could address this, uh, Mr. Weatherspoon, um, if you could address the issues at the community level as it relates to this. And I would also 
like you to talk about what's being done, because as much as we can talk about this problem endlessly, as we do all the time, we have a very unique panel here that can address ways of making change that can actually improve the situation. So I want us to discuss that as well. All right. Uh, for those of you that don't, that don't know me, I'm a retired detective. I served with the, well, depending upon your age, you would not know, the New York City <coughs> Transit Police and with NYPD. Uh, I was a detective in the major case unit for the Transit Police and following the, major, the merge of 1995, I went into NYPD. Um, I rejected NYPD in 1973 when I took the police exam because of the Knapp Commission. I did not want to be part of a corrupt institution. They called me four or five times. I took the transit police exam. I told them, I don't want your job. Um, but I, I am thankful. I was a victim of police abuse as a child growing up in East New York, so I know about it. And I was also the victim while working, because I worked in plain clothes. And I was attacked in Midtown because I was black running down the street while attempting to effect an arrest. Our inhumanity is unparalleled. When I started as a police officer, this was my bulletproof vest. See, 40 years ago, we didn't have bulletproof vests. We were real cops. We did the job because we liked it. We weren't afraid to do the job, and we didn't know about bulletproof vests because they didn't exist. But I took the job just as Eric spoke, and I, re I remember when Eric was a rookie. I had to sit him down a couple of times. <laughs> we still do. <laughs> <laughs> but, <clears throat> I took the job because I didn't want somebody else like some of the other people I'd encountered earlier in my life getting that job. I was born and raised in East New York. I went to Thomas Jefferson High School and attended City College here in Harlem. I didn't want an out-of-towner coming into my neighborhood creating havoc. Please bear with me because I stood in Hamadou's doorway that morning and I've been on a lot of crime scenes and I had already retired when Amadou was killed. But I knew then as an investigator that the story was a lie. I've seen how politicians and the media have played with these cases to, correct, to protect the wrongdoing of some police officers. When Desmond Robinson was shot, I grabbed the sergeant who was attempting to tamper with the ballistic evidence in that case. And they had no problems discussing openly what they were going to do. As I sat in the room, they could care less. But I wasn't going to allow it to happen as long as I had that case. What they do consistently, the press is given information by the department, DCPI, Deputy Commissioner of Public Information. 
Their job is to keep the image of the police department pristine. So they will feed information to the press. And what, they, what the press does, they publish it and they contaminate the jury pool. Because you're told that the person had a criminal record, he had this, he had that, blah, 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 blah. So your mind is already set be long before the trial. You already have it set in your mind that, well, this, this guy was a bad guy. Or uh, he was an immigrant. So because he's an immigrant, he's less than us. Let's understand the American way of doing things. The elephant in the room is racism, and we're not going to discuss it. Barack Obama can't discuss the issue in the room. They call him everything but a nigger to his face, but they call him that. And I'm using that term because it is offensive, and I'm sorry. But race is the issue, and classism is the issue. I spoke with Mrs. Bush. Her son, Gideon, was shot down in Brooklyn. He was mentally ill. They killed a mentally ill Jewish man because he had a hammer in his hand. The Nazis eliminated mentally ill people. This is not just happening to black people. It's happening to white people. It's happening to people. And the trauma is another thing that's not even being discussed. I'm, I'm going I'm to try and be brief. I've sat with Mrs. Diallo. I've sat with Mr. and Mrs. Bell. Bud Bell hasn't slept a night since his son was murdered. I can go down the list with the families. How do these people survive after the loss, after the press is gone? How do they deal with trauma? There was one woman who works for the police department. Her son was killed by a police officer, Timothy Stansbury. And his mother has wrestled with suicide since his death. As she sees women walking their children to school, and she's a school crossing guard, but her son is gone. Fear is another ill that we're not dealing with. There are 52 states in the United States, one being the state of fear and the state of denial. And most of our population is coexisting in those two states. We have police officers who are out here that are deathly afraid to be out there. That's like putting a drunk behind the wheel of a car. The young man who was shot in the pink houses, by that rookie officer, a dark stairway is not grounds for drawing your weapon. If you're scared, stay home. Seek other employment. Because we cannot, we can't go on with these excuses. Legislators, it is an affirmative defense for the police officer if he can articulate, and we are told if you can articulate, you're good. So if the officer articulates that he was in fear or she was in fear of their life and that was the reason why they fired the shot which killed you, it is an affirmative defense and they're not going to be prosecuted. How is it that the state legislature put this law into effect? And how you're taught to think. When I was at City College, I was in the ROTC program, and we were being trained in counterinsurgency and guerrilla warfare. They said, we will train you to determine how people should think. That's what the government does. So we want you to think a certain way. NYPD's problem is a lack of integrity. One of their problems. When I joined the transit police, as a married man, I had to sign an affidavit of fidelity. Now, you don't even know what that is. 
As a married man, I had to swear to the fact that I would not get involved in an extramarital affair while I was employed by the New York City Transit Police. That was the standard. And if I did, I lost my job. And trust me, back then, guys lost their jobs. Good. That was the standard. <laughs> But the, the, the issue of integrity, the use of media to malign people, stop and frisk was a pattern program of racism to eliminate young black men from the labor force. Because once you're in the system, you can't get a job. All right, I, you know, this I, is- I'm sorry, we don't have enough time. I'm, I'm yeah, I apologize. I don't, I'm, I'm, your remarks are so profound and so important. We, we are running a little behind. Uh, our keynote ran a little over, and I want to give Norman Siegel a, a chance to speak and then open it up to everybody. I think um, uh, Mr. Weatherspoon, I do know who you are, and I do remember your story, and, and I'm so, appreciative that you could share it here today. I think what you're talking about is completely relevant to what's going on in the city today. And um, I'm wondering if, Norman, you could build on Mr. Weatherspoon's remarks and talk about the systemic issues from your perspective as well, uh, as the perspective as uh, the perspective that was provided by Mr. Weatherspoon from the police department. and where the legal issues have continued to be a problem in police community relations and where we have made progress, if you think we have. <clears throat> Let me uh, set forth three myths that I think we have to understand and then make some half a dozen specific recommendations to how to improve police community relations. The first myth, it's an isolated incident. With stunning predictability, mayors and police commissioners have insisted that police brutality is a rare occurrence. But facts belie the assertion. In 1994, you may remember the Mullen Commission, and in 1996, Amnesty International documented the serious pattern of police brutality in New York. It's my position, it's still a problem. Police brutality <clears throat> is no aberration. The second myth, Graham touched upon it, police brutality is not a race issue. Well, the sooner we recognize the painful reality that there are racial overtones to police brutality, the sooner we can begin to overcome the shameful and persistent facts. Uh, three out of every four complaints at the Civilian Complaint Review Board historically, as well as currently, come from the African American and Latino community. Race is a factor in the patterns of police brutality. And finally, the one that always gets me, uh, the problem is only a few bad apples. Uh, this metaphor distorts and dismisses the need for systemic change. Don't get me wrong. The overwhelming majority, you heard it even from a critic like myself, the overwhelming majority of people in the NYPD are good people. You just take a look at the two officers who were gunned down on December 20th, when we find out about them, they're model citizens, they're good people. And they became cops for the good reasons. But historically, as well as currently, there has always been and continues to be a significant enough number, hostile, abusive, and bigoted, who taint the entire police force by sustaining an atmosphere of abuse and tolerance for brutality. When they say it's a handful, this is a handful. In my opinion, from studying this issue, we're talking about somewhere between one and two percent of the police department who shouldn't be cops. Therefore, we're talking about 400 to 800 police officers. It's not a few bad apples. And whenever you hear that, uh, you should reject that. So what can we do? Let me quickly, hopefully in five minutes. Uh, first, and I commend Mayor Dinkins for historically creating the first independent civilian complaint review board. <laughs> I 
inherent in the concept of a democracy is the idea that we the people, civilians, should have oversight and control over those who we pay and we empower to use deadly physical force. Unfortunately, this principle has still not been achieved satisfactorily in New York City. An essential and much needed reform is the strengthening of the CCRB. I wrote the original legislation some 22 years ago. I remember the day we got the city council to pass it 41 to 8. Those of us who were carrying this torch for another generation who wasn't with us anymore, uh, we went home euphoric thinking that we had achieved something historical. 22 years later, the dream of civilian review has been at least deferred or maybe even become a nightmare because it still doesn't work. So we need to create some systemic change there, such as the CCRB should hold monthly town hall meetings like this in every neighborhood in the city of New York. They need to act upon complaints within a, let's say, four month period from when it's filed. Their annual report should be put out within 30 days whenever the year ends, not six months later. Uh, there's things that still can be done. Uh, the statute of limitations is 18 months. It should be changed to three years. That's the statute in federal court for civil rights cases, not 18 months. And second, uh, residency requirement. A residency requirement tied to an affirmative action plan for police officers as a condition of employment is strongly recommended to improve police community relations and increase the effectiveness of NYPD. Current members of the NYPD would be exempt from this requirement, so we don't go backwards, we just do it prospectively. I believe a more representative police department, especially people who did foot patrol once again, would be very important for improving police community relations. Uh, third, and Eric Adams uh, talked about it, so I won't go into great detail on it, but we do need an independent, I believe, statewide special prosecutor for both police corruption and brutality. Uh, they're linked, and it's very important. Uh, I know the Knapp Commission uh, concluded in its final report that it was impractical for local district attorneys to deal with police misconduct. I'll just quote one part of their report. The district attorneys in the five counties and the Department of Investigation, although they have a few non-police investigators, depend primarily upon policemen to conduct investigations. In the case of the district attorneys, there is an additional problem that they work so closely with police that the public tends to look upon them, and indeed they tend to look upon themselves as allies of the department. What that says is there's a conflict of interest built in. The prosecutor has to rely on who? The police for every hour of their job to get the high percentage with regard to convictions. Elizabeth Holtzman, I remember when she, in the 80s, when she was the DA in Brooklyn, set up a special unit to deal with police misconduct. And the next week, the PBA had 7,000 people at it lunchtime picketing her. And what happened about a month or two later, that unit was disbanded. Uh, this is a very important concept. Uh, the governor doesn't go for it. We have to try to persuade him that it is necessary. Uh, police community relations training. Uh, a police officer who lives out the city, uh, I've heard twice in my career where they say something like, I've got to go to the zoo, deal with the F animals. Uh, on the other hand, I have clients who say, here come the pigs. Uh, it's interesting, both segments using animal terms to describe human beings. I think that's part of the problem. But when I was on a task force after Admiral Weimer and had access to the training material, I was shocked. The training material at the Academy, and again, it was 15 years ago, uh, the training material, the written material reinforced the stereotypes. Uh, for example, it had two paragraphs on the quickest growing immigrant community in the city at that time, the Dominican community. Two paragraphs devoted to the Dominican community but then three or four pages to devoted to the Hasidic community in Crown Heights. So what else? Uh, describing the African American community, it had Willie Mays came up to Harlem, 
one afternoon to play stickball in the streets, sports metaphor. To the Latino community, it talked about salsa music playing through the air in East Harlem. At least they didn't say Spanish Harlem. So in the context of that, you come in as a 22-year-old white guy from Westchester. Again, what Eric said, not interacting with a multiracial society. So you read this material. If you're assigned to Washington Heights, you figure, I ain't got to worry too much because that community doesn't have political power. But if I'm assigned to Crown Heights, oh, I better be very careful. That's not what equal justice under the law is all about. Another specific change, it takes me three years to become a lawyer. The training for cops at the academy is six months. It should be a year. They should be trained properly. And psychological testing. Mm. Another thing I was shocked. When someone comes into the NYPD, they're given a psych exam. But then they're never given a psych exam again until <laughs> something happens to bring them in. They get periodic firearms training. I recommend that every five years or whatever, randomly with due process, of course, police randomly be called in to see whether the stress of the job, and it's an incredibly stressful job, uh, just take a look at the divorce rates within the police world. Maybe there's a walking time bomb out there that we can address. I also recommend, this is always controversial, just as professors get sabbaticals, police officers should get sabbaticals. Every eight years, a police officer should be given three months with pay, full pay, to perhaps go work in a community social justice program, or maybe six months, half pay, so that they can get out of the job, get their head, see it differently, and come back. Also, if we find out that the cop is stressed out, it shouldn't be a disciplinary proceeding against them. We should be supportive, recognizing Hell, I do my work, I get stressed out a lot too, and my work is nothing compared to what police officers have to do. We need to be more humanistic and more supportive of the cops who are dealing with their stress. So these are some of, and the grand jury. Eric went into it, uh, I was glad that he's uh, 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 on the grounds for reform on the grand jury. What Governor Cuomo is proposing is a monitor to look at them. Uh, that's not good enough. Uh, Right now, 26 states in America have created an alternative to the grand jury process. Two states, Connecticut and Pennsylvania, list very close to us, have abolished the grand jury with regard to felonies. And the reason this happens is because the prosecutors control what goes on in the grand jury. I sat on a grand jury 15 years ago, and don't ask me why they didn't knock me off. Uh, they were sorry, my grand jury went on strike. We made certain <laughs> demands with regard to the process. I wanted to write about it, but D.A. Morgenthau told me that I could not. If you write about what goes on in the grand jury, it's a felony. Uh, that in and of itself is quite telling. Ferguson, and I wish that young man was still here because I'd take him on on that issue. And Staten Island, just think of it. You see the video with regard to Eric Gardner. And with regard to Eric Adams, I have questions about the body cameras uh, because we have the video with regard to Eric Gardner and it didn't change anything. But the thing that gets the resentment and the confusion and why people hit the streets, you see the video and then we're told that there's no indictment. Remember, indictment just means there's probable cause to go to trial. It doesn't mean that the person is found guilty of anything. Right, right. But the problem becomes the grand jury is secret. So secrecy breeds distrust and mistrust. And today, right now, while we're sitting here, there's a hearing in Staten Island with the Civil Liberties Union and the public advocate and legal aid trying to get the minutes. I've tried twice in my legal career to get the minutes of a grand jury and deny both times. We could redact the names to keep the privacy. That information has to become public. And the alternative is a preliminary hearing that's public before a judge with lawyers on both sides 
and the public can see, because maybe there is a reason why the cop who did what he did to Eric Gardner should not be found guilty. I can't think of it at this point, but if I heard the testimony, if I heard the arguments, maybe it would persuade me. But when you don't hear that stuff, no wonder people resent the system. They think it's fixed. I don't think it's fixed, but I think it needs a lot of reform. And therefore, these are some of the issues. What's the answer? Where do we go from here? It's all of us. Okay, Until well that's we a good demand. segue, Norman, <laughs> for me to bring in our group here into the conversation. I think our panel has set us up well for the conversation that Mayor Dinkins and Mrs. Diallo wanted to have about police community relations. So I'd like for those of you who have questions to please come up to the mic and, and please try and in the, in the interest of time and fairness, where a lot of people, we, we'd like this to be a, uh, a robust discourse, but please try and ask a question. This is an unusual opportunity, having this amazing panel here. And if you want to address it to somebody in particular on the panel, please do so. If not, um, I'll, I'll choose the respondent. Thank you. Rose. Good afternoon. I want to thank you very much for all your comments, uh, both on the system, New York, and your personal experiences. Um, it's very motivational and enlightening for me. I just want to say, Mr. Uh, Witherspoon, that uh, your experience as a, as a boy uh, reminded me that in the 1990s, I was in the South Bronx. Um, I'm a native New Yorker, born on the east side, 97th Street. Uh, I was in the South Bronx with a group of psychologists. They had just gotten federal funds to study public schools. At a time when the police were making it into public schools, we were in the middle schools. Um, and it just reminds me the kind of scar that's left behind. We see racism when it reaches stories around violence against commu our communities. But the fact is that every single day I noticed the relationship between the police and children and how they were disrespected. And I was thinking of how scarred they were becoming young in age and how this will continue in their lives. Um, where disciplining children was done in a way that it was policing children. And so we talk about racism and authority abuse, uh, misuse power, but it's happening every day in these contexts, in these communities. It doesn't always get the spotlight, but it is affecting lives in a very profound way. I just wanted to say that. Thank, Thank you. you so much for that comment. Does anybody want to comment on that, or I'll move to the next question. No, just briefly, children Thank are, you. I heard a woman I think Aisha was there when we were at the 3-2 precinct years ago. A parent said, a police officer abused my child. A child is like wet cement. And the impression that you make in that child leaves a permanent scar. Can you Take that child and break them up into little pieces, grind them up and remix the mortar and cast a new mold. Our children are like wet cements, cement. And actually, every human being is like wet cement because the negative impact is definitely going to leave a mark and a scar. Thank, Thank you. you. Our next question, please. Thank you. Oh, right. I, I didn't see two mics. Okay, so apologies. Hi. Thank you so much, everybody, for your input. Um, I want, actually wanted to bring up... Could you, so, could you give us your name? Oh, I'm please. sorry. I'm Nadia Hussain. I'm with the Andrew Goodman Foundation in New Jersey. Sure. Um, and to thank you all for having us here. Um, so I wanted to actually bring up my one of my mentors and, and really good friends, Shamtali Huck. I don't know if you're familiar with her name. She was the head of council for a public defender, Letitia James. And she, she herself was harassed very violently in, in public um, while waiting for her children to go to the bathroom. She is South Asian Muslim, 
she was dressed like in a traditional, like more of a South Asian gear. She wasn't in her business suit that day. She had literally just uh, taken sabbatical from from her position, a very high position, a public servant like many of you here who, who had done your roles as well. And even with what happened with her um, and some of the stories of corruption that you brought up um, openly and that are still happening um, as you're talking about things like the grand jury, you talked about in the past, um, the case moving to Albany. If something, this is another example of another public servant. She's not the only one. You, you spoke about your experience, uh, Mr. Witherspoon, as a, as a young man, um, but there are public servants who see their own children suffering or themselves going through something. If they don't even get justice, what chance does the population have um, against this? And I, I really love a lot of the solutions that you all brought up today, because they are solutions. But what do we do now? I mean, none, like you said, this is not gonna implement overnight, but it just seems like, it's, it just seems like there, what do you really do in the face of something like this? Even if you have the power and authority, you're still kind of shut out. I think you join the demonstrations. I think you speak up, you come to forums like this. Uh, I think you write letters to the editor. You write op-ed pieces. You lobby uh, elected officials. I, I do, when I say elected yes. officials, I want to thank John Liu for being here, the former controller. Uh, I think I think that you recognize that it's not a 100-yard dash, it's a marathon, and that realistically we're talking about incremental progress. And in that context, you become an activist for social justice change using all these tools. You never give up. It's good to be smart, but the most important ingredient is stamina. You have to outlast the bastards. I'm gonna ask our next questioner to speak. Good afternoon, my name is John Martin Green and I am co-artistic director of Blackberry Productions, a documentary theater and arts in education company. And uh, first, let me say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you to all of you for the work that you are doing on our behalves. Um, I am also a doctoral candidate in the health education program uh, at Teachers College and in a partnership with uh, New Heights Academy High School and members of the 30th Precinct have begun a community engagement strategy between police and uh, young black and brown people uh, in which we are using motivational interviewing as a community engagement strategy. So the, the intention is to shift the dynamic from an authoritarian one with police and our young people in the community to one of mentoring. And uh, it's in uh, leadership training for the young people. And I'm wondering if you've any thoughts as to how we might marshal support for this kind of initiative uh, from either corporate or other private and or public entities. Um, so far, the community is supporting the initiative. The people at the high school and surrounding community love it. The police have said thank you and are looking forward to continuing these workshops which we've begun. Well, you, you might uh, keep in mind that, that every council member has so-called discretionary funds. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I definitely you ought to go at them and see what you can do. Uh, Police Athletically does some pretty good work. You might uh, be in touch with them. Bob Morgenthau, the former district attorney of New York County, is the, the uh, head of the uh, PAL. Now, these are just some, some of the ideas. Y you might go at any elected official, for that matter. Uh, you know, I often, uh, people, 
come to me and they with problems, and I, I give them the best advice I can. But but I tell them, I said, you got to understand, I don't have the staff. I, I, I said, but every borough president has a staff. City council members have staff. State legislators have staff. These are the persons to whom you should go. When I'm not talking to you now, in general, when one has a problem, the idea being that they've got the capacity to put somebody on the case. You have sort of a project manager to take care of the problem <coughs> brought to them by Norman Siegel. So let me work at that. Um, where, whereas uh, they come to me, um, I, I got. Linda, oh, where is she back there? And my bride, and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Also, Thank you. there's I private foundations we'll like the New York Foundation, the Sherman Foundation would be good places to go. They've supported social justice activities. And on a project like this, I would test the police foundation. They got a lot of money. They use it for other stuff. Maybe there's a way to put a proposal in, get the precinct commander to support your letter, and see if the police foundation would support it. Also, uh, grants.gov, uh, there um, are RFPs just, uh, just so available. you know, we have uh, a representative from Gail Brewer's office, a borough president of Manhattan, who just gave me her card, and I'm sure you can see her in the back, Athena Moore. Thanks, Athena, and thank well, you to Also, president there's someone Gail from the Brewer. Inspector General's office here, right? So we should introduce her, too. That's a new office. Right. I'm and just hiding. the last suggestion, since you mentioned you are a PhD candidate at Teachers College, uh, I think a very useful thing to do would be to organize uh, a co-curricular group of your fellow students and then take it to the administration at Teachers College for support to write these proposals that to the foundations uh, that Norman Siegel suggested and even to the um, electeds who I think can help you with this. Have I done this before? Yes. <laughs> and, and, if they, and if they say no, do a sit-in. You know, we used to do it. <laughs> I didn't say that. Norman said that. I said, All right, I'll defend go, you. Let's go to our next question. What, what, yeah, I would like to identify myself yes, as Marie. Marie is a common name for many Haitians, oh, women. I'll tell you. And I'm not, this is not my real name. I'm a government employee, a mother with a disabled child. But mostly, before I said anything, uh, I'm glad that I'm here. It's a beginning, a step forward toward open and honest discussion. But unfortunately, it does not exist, whether it's in the black community or Haitian community. By the way, I'm someone who's with HIV, and they hate it, and the level of fear that I experience in my life in New York City is hell. By the way, uh, my question, uh, well, let me not ask a question, I'll put in a comment form. Yes. Former Councilman Archie Spigner did sexually abuse me. That means sitting in a car, providing him with oral sex and pulling the steering wheel over my head when I have asthma and I cannot breathe. This is sexual abuse, sexual trafficking. And I've approached Mr. Po uh, the attorney here, on several occasions, I never get help. I do not get help for disabled family members where vigilant police are attacking my family members. And I did all I did to support them because nobody in New York City is providing them with the assistance needed to support them. My sister, who was in medical school, graduate medical school has been sitting at home doing almost nothing and I'm not afraid if this young African man whom I dated possibly worked for Eric Gardner I might have important valuable information about the case of Eric Gardner. Thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you for sharing your pain. Um, I know we're all sorry to hear this story. Uh, um, may God bring you healings, uh, sister, and Thank the you. help you need. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Diallo. Hello, my name is
name is Tanisha Austin. I'm from Before you do that, for the record, I never heard that story beforehand. So the representation that someone came to me, it's the first time I've ever heard that story. Hello, my name is Tanisha Austin. I'm from News 12 Bronx. And my question is for you, Ms. Diallo, and or anyone on the panel. In light of the recent police shootings, what um, what are your hopes for your foundation for the coming year in bridging that gap between mistrust between the community and the NYPD and vice versa? <coughs> um, let me get you to sit down. Well, this is part of it. This is part this of it part right of it. here. Thank you so much. Um, I would have to say uh, the Amadou Diallo Foundation really need to play a key role, and I hope that um, New York at large will grab the hand we are extending. Uh, we are here to uh, start this conversation and to bring people, in, uh, police and community together. When uh, the recent shootings happened, as you know, whenever an incident like that happened, I, I will relive my tragedy again, over and over again. And in fact, I always travel to see the families uh, of Eric Garner, we were there. Mrs. Pa is here with me, and uh, many other families. Even um, Timothy Sambury would be when you, uh, uh, Mrs. Bush, Gideon Bush, yeah. Mrs. Baez. We have this, uh, this uh, kind of um, uh, co connection, spiritual connection, because we share grief, and we share, we share similar experiences. So my hope is that the foundation will set an example to uh, bring people together and also do the work to bridge the gap. When the two police officers were killed recently, I came forward and I went and do many different shows. And I said then, which I continue to say, for many people, they will think I have, will agree, I have every reason to be bitter, every reason to ask for revenge. But in my heart, I have no hate. I believe in forgiveness. I believe in social justice. Social justice, <coughs> not violence. Unfortunately, the young man here left too soon because I wanted to grab him and talk to him personally. If I can do this, if I can do this, why not you? Do you have to burn the house to, to bring the light? No. You can light a torch, or you can put a lamp, or if you don't have it, light a candle. Do something positive. Change your anger. Translate it into positive, into, into a cause for change. Eric Adams said, he could have been inspired to be a policeman. If you don't want to be a policeman, be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. If you don't want to be a lawyer, <laughs> be someone who can, who can bring up, I mean, you can mentor children. Right, right. You can do all kinds of work that can bring change. If you are angry enough, do not use violence. So thank you for that question. And I hope that the Amadou Diallo Foundation will be heard and will continue this work together with all the different organizations who are doing the same thing. And thank you, Nadia, from the Andrew Goodman Foundation for your work, too. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Okay. I, didn't, I didn't get an opportunity to tell this young man this, Dr. Goodman. The, the uh, district attorney forfeiture money. Right. Whoa. And and the, the forfeiture money can only be used for criminal justice type things. So it's an idea. You may you might using and suggesting from Norman somebody to, to draft proposals and send one to each of the five DAs. Well good. Uh, can't hurt. Uh, you know once you once you've constructed the application, then they just replicate it. 
and um, and let's see. It's a legitimate cause. I, I'm right now. I know that the New York DA is looking at um, putting money into uh, the backlog on uh, DNA in rape cases because mm. they got tons of them stacked up. Anybody that watches Law and Order, you, you know about that. And uh, and and I suggest that they ought to consider bulletproof vests. You know, bulletproof vests last about five years, and uh, it's a way. So anyway, that's a further thought. Thank you, Mayor. I'm going to jump in and ask the question of Jerome Rice from the NAACP because he can't speak. Um, Many times during senseless shootings, the police commissioner chooses to hide behind the mayor. What is your position on making the office of police commissioner become an elected Elected. position? Uh, Uh Everybody can just briefly respond to that. Um, It's an interesting question. Uh Norman, you want to start? (laughs) Yeah, I know I'm going to disappoint you. I think the mayor should be the one who is uh, accountable uh, we elect the mayor. Uh, the idea of having a mayor and a police commissioner at odds uh, would trouble me. I think we have to hold the mayor responsible. Uh, and uh, so, I, I, at first, I liked the idea. Uh, I thought it was a good idea. It could shake up the system. But the more I think about it, uh, I would think it's not a good idea. Yeah, sometimes structural change can actually make things worse. Divided responsibility, I think, is probably not the way to go on this. Does anybody want to speak to the positive? With with the mayor making that decision, what we as the general public need to inquire of any candidate is who is their intended choice for police commissioner before the election. Yes. Mm -hmm. That would be a better move. So you're not surprised uh, down the road. And even if the person doesn't keep their word, then you go to the ballot box in four years. And Just think if you had change. a Graham Weatherspoon as the police commissioner. Mm. That's oh. right. <laughs> okay, so. Half of the people might be gone after that. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm fine. I'm just okay. let the experts answer that. <laughs> okay, sir. My name, my name is Carlton Berkeley. I'm a retired New York City detective, and I'm an original member of the 100 Blacks in Law Enforcement Who Care. Graham is one of the original, Eric, myself, and Jerome Rice. And Ms. Diallo, we also, when your son was killed, we, we for the history on the 100 Blacks and a member of the National Latino, we always went against the police department when we saw controversial shootings and because we did that, you know we had a hard time in the, in, in the department, mm-hmm. but it didn't stop us and we continue to do that now. Um, Norman, Norman said, and I worked with Norman and I supported Norman when he was running um, for office plenty of times, but Norman, you said you don't believe that the system is corrupt, right? The grants, the, 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 crim- uh, the judicial system. Well, at times now, I think it is corrupt, and I'll tell you why, for a couple of reasons. One, when I was a cop, right, or when cops get killed, there's always an indictment, 100%. Mm -hmm. But when a cop kills someone else, right, specifically blacks and Hispanics, 0%. 0% we get indictments, never, all right? So with 100% going one way and zero the other, there's something wrong with that. And I was a cop for 20 years. You talked about there's uh, something like a grand jury being brought to the public. What about even before we get there, because I believe the system is corrupt already. Before we even get there, what about CPL 240? All right, what about repealing CPL 240? For those of you who don't know, CPL 240, right, gives the district attorney the right to withhold evidence that can prove a person innocent. Mm. All right, they, and, and, and I know you, don't, you guys don't know about it, but this has been going on for a long time. Now, they have to give up certain evidence, but exculpatory evidence, all it means is evidence that can prove a person innocent. District attorneys within the five boroughs, right, withhold that. So now with a system that's already corrupt, right, and now you got the district attorney withholding evidence that can prove a person innocent. Just recently in the Bronx, 
where a female district attorney withheld evidence and a, and a young Hispanic male had to spend eight additional months in Rikers Island, and when a judge reprimanded her, the judge got reprimanded, right. you, you, you know, when the district attorney should have. And, and last but least, you talk about video. All right, well, you didn't talk about video. I think Eric did, and I wasn't here. I'm against the video, because you know what? Why do we have to keep inventing the wheel? The best video to have is someone standing outside That's when there's right. a police encounter, That's right. you know, and let that person video just like in the Eric Garner, because see, I know what's gonna happen. When cops are, are put on those body cameras, what's gonna stop another cop from standing in front of the cop with the camera? Because the, the cop with the camera is just gonna stand there, and then later on he's gonna say, oh, I couldn't video because the officer was standing in front of me. Because whenever a cop is doing something wrong, you have other cops that try to protect him and stand right in front of him. So I don't believe in cops having body cameras. It makes no sense. We got people with cell phones. Let independent people who can stand 20 feet away videotape and let us use that videotape. And last but not least, I'm looking to get my boy Pat Lynch. I don't like to play the racial card, but yet and still, you have in Brooklyn, and I'm glad Ken Tom uh, uh, Thompson is there, in Brooklyn, you had just recently had three cops indicted for beating up people because of a video. But yet and still, the same video that saw Eric Garner get killed, Pantaleo doesn't get indicted. Don't tell me the system is not corrupt. It is corrupt, That's and right. it needs to be changed from the bottom one up. That's right. Well, in a strange way, let me try to defend the system. Uh, first of all, I don't think it's corrupt. When I hear the word corruption, I hear that people get paid to make decisions. That's what corruption means to me. If you want to say that the system is biased, I'll agree with that, but it's not corrupt. We should define our terms and be precise. Second, with regard to your statement with due respect, any exculpatory evidence that a DA holds would lead to a dismissal of any indictment or conviction. Any criminal defense lawyer who knows that the DA is holding evidence that could acquit and show innocence of their defendant should be speaking up, and if you find out after the fact, you could move to get the case thrown out. So I disrespectfully, I mean, I respectfully disagree with your statement on that. As far as body cameras, if you heard what I was saying before, I have lots of questions about body cameras. I'm concerned that the body cameras will wind up with a huge database on activists in the city of New York, so that before the next demonstration, the cops will look at their database and find out the 50 most activist protesters in the city of New York, and then they'll target them. They already uh, so do. I'm concerned. <laughs> well, do. if it's happening, talk to me afterwards, and we can try to stop that. I think that the body cameras, uh, it was a, a meeting yesterday with people from the city and said to them, you should not be even having a pilot project until you answer the question of when did the camera go on, when does it go off, if I'm hanging out on the corner or having a political discussion with the Nation of Islam, are you then going to know that and you're going to keep that in your database and use that against me later on? Uh, I also want to know, is there a database? How long will you keep this information? And you should not be doing body cameras until we get the answers to these questions. And they sat there and they had no answers to me. So as far as I'm concerned, I'm not for the body cameras, even though my good friend Eric Adams is a big advocate of it, until we get the answers to those questions. And finally, with the cell phones, let me just say we have a lawsuit right now in the Southern District. You have, in my opinion, a First Amendment right to take out your cell phone and to record people. The police sometimes arrest people for mm -hmm. doing that. Mm -hmm. So the policy at the NYPD is that you have a right to do this but I don't trust the policy anymore because they're not implementing it, so we've gone to court to establish a constitutional right for everyone to be able to do this without interfering with the police doing their job. So if there's anyone who, in fact, gets arrested or told that they can't use the cell phone to record what's going on, please call me and we'll add you to the lawsuit. Okay, okay I'm gonna, can I, can I'm I sorry, say, just in the... Well, I just wanna say one thing to... Okay. and a person had to stay in jail. When the, when the system, when the district attorney holds all 52 cards, 
the deck is stacked against everybody. Mm. And as far as, and as far as, and, and Norman, you know that they withhold evidence. And, and as far as the body cam, I mean, the uh, activist goes, listen to what happened, look what happened to Order. The day he, he filmed Eric Garner, the day he did that, the next day he was arrested. Like and you know what, and I'm an activist, and I carry a gun, and I carry a badge, right, being retired. And let me tell you something, I'm gonna continue to be an activist, I'm gonna continue to go out there and do it, and I'm teach everybody else, and last but not least, I'm, I'm doing things in the community because with this book I educate everyone, and Good. especially parents, on what they should do when, when, when young men are stopped by the police, when they are walking in the street, when they stopped in the car, when the police come at their house, what to do when they brought to the police precinct because people don't know what to, um, what to do when they brought there. But Norman, the system is corrupt. Uh, well, I'm glad biased. you brought your uh, book because if you have copies, uh, I'm sure people will want that. And thank you for the important uh, comments and questions. We don't have much time. I'd like to give as many people as possible an opportunity to speak. So let's try and respect each other's time here. Go ahead. Uh, peace. Uh, one, I want to say thank you for having this panel. And I see all the wonderful people uh, at the pa on the panel and, oh, excuse me, and in the room that I've worked with. Uh, my name is Aisha Sekou. I'm the CEO and founder of an organization called Street Corner Resources. We do anti-violence work directly on the street, outreach with young people who are or are or have been gang affiliated. With that, it puts us in direct uh, uh, path of NYPD as well. And we've done a lot of work in terms of engaging in the community. My concern is with working with young people that Young people have been abused so much in so many different ways by the police. I don't know if you saw one of the most recent videos in New Rochelle, New York, where the police uh, were called when kids were having a snowball fight. This was just last week. The kids knew immediately to go on the ground with their hands up. They didn't run. You could see the fear. The cop had the gun out, right at the, basically at the kid's head, and was pointing it at the other kids saying, get on the ground. So. That was in New Rochelle, but that happens in Harlem so more times than, I mean, we, we don't hear about it. Kids are thrown up against the wall, they're in the projects, they're in the hallway, the stairwell, and police have the guns drawn. Our children, my concern is, is the spirit of our children. What happens with a 13-year-old when he's having a snowball fight and the police have the gun drawn? What happens to the young person who's having a regular fight that kids have in school and the police are called into the school, other kids watch, young people get arrested over something that young people would normally walk away from? No weapon, no gun, nothing, but of course a negative encounter with the police. The other thing is, is young people are being found wrong no matter where they are, even when they're right in their community. So when they leave school, when they leave the basketball game, when they're coming from the church program, when they're just hanging out in front of their building, the police are jumping out of cars, grabbing them up, throwing them up against the wall, and it's still happening. Even though they say stop, search and frisk has stopped, it has not stopped. So my concern, it's really not a question, my concern is the spirit of our young people in our community, and what are we creating in watching that kind of spirit continue to form, especially where the police are concerned and where the violence with gangs are concerned. So either way, kids are in a very difficult situation, and we have to look at that, because we're creating a whole generation of young people out of fear, fear they cannot move through their community and do normal things like have a snowball fight. So I Thank think that we you. have to begin to think about what are we going to do? I mean, it's great to talk about it, but we have to take some action. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now, we have a very limited amount of time. We have to be out of this room at noon. So in the interests of giving everybody who's standing an opportunity to speak, um, I'm going to ask our panel to hold their comments so I can give yes. everybody one yes. last comment. Yes. And just, if you could be, I know these issues are difficult and I know everybody has so much to bring to this conversation, but if you could be as concise as possible, it would be helpful so that everybody can, who's standing can have an opportunity to, to speak. So, please. All right, my name's Riley and I'm with NYC Revolution Club. So you can probably guess by the name, I'm thoroughly convinced that none of this is actually gonna change 
fundamentally short of a revolution. And I stand with this guy, Noche, that interrupted the speech, with this guy trash-talking Ferguson. It is true that we would not be here today if Ferguson did not compel people all over this country to stand up and compel those in power to actually need to come out and give us some kind of solutions. But the ones that have pre been presented, the ones that he were, was presenting earlier, have been tried. And some of them are, you know, that are being raised here, are, some of them are new. But I want to know, do you think that these kinds of solutions are actually commensurate with this police murder epidemic that is fraught throughout this country? Okay. Next. And we're going to, you're going to hear these questions and then you're going to choose to address different aspects of all the questions. So I'm going to go through all the questioners so everybody gets a chance to say what they need to say. Speak into the mic, please. My name is Sandra Schulte. My question is, why guns? We, here we are in the age of technology. Why guns? Why not some of the other way to uh, stop persons? Uh, Very important question. Okay. Uh, also, why not sensitivity uh, trait on job in the community, sensitivity training for police officers on a regular basis? We know that cops are given uh, classes to educate themselves in different problems. Why not uh, in the community doing sensitive, uh, uh, practicing sensitivity training? Another question, and it's been brought up already, we have, we have a, a situation where there's less and less police officers walking the beat, getting to know the community, and also are the same police officers staying on the beat so they can get to know the community Besides, uh, you have to be in the community for a, lo a long period of time for them to accept you, to be become part of the family. Okay, thank you. Uh, hi, uh, I came here today not planning to say anything, but I feel compelled to. My name is Craig Wolf, and I am in the company of your old friends, Mayor Dinkins, <laughs> Norman, and Mrs. Diallo. I am a former reporter at the New York Times, uh, and I had really uh, a privilege, one of the great privileges of my life to help Mrs. Diallo write uh, her book um, about not only uh, Amadou, but about her life out of Africa. And I, when I heard you say, talk about all the different ways in which people can affect change, I thought I, thought I had to come up here as a storyteller who believes, perhaps idealistically, in the power of story, Amadou became a caricature in the media, the unarmed West African street vendor. You could scarcely read a story in any of the newspapers that didn't characterize him that way. Moreover, sending money home to his poor parents in the village. <coughs> Amadou spoke several languages, as That's Mrs. Right. Diallo said, yes, five right. languages, schooled in the finest French and English schools where diplomats would send their kids. Uh, each parent independently wealthy. Uh, father started his fortune selling on a street, uh, on a road in Senegal. We traveled through Guinea, through the Futa Jalan mountain region. When I talk about lifting people out of caricature, and I have a former student who heard me say this a lot, I don't mean that idly. We have to supply the specific contours of who they are, what they like, what they eat, what they read, who they love. Amadou, I feel like I never met him, and I feel like I know him, because I know that he got sick when he was five years old, and you came to him, and his teeth were blackened, and you told him bedtime stories of the monkeys who were the king of the monkeys who was guilty and he sank into the river and she told him these stories. She was a girl herself and the food that they ate and, and all of that. I don't know if there are writers in here. I don't know if there are journalists in here, but I really encourage you to try and lift people up out of caricature in everything you do. And I have to say that I'm moved to, this is Amadou's day as well. It's his anniversary. And, uh, and I think of him, by the way, more on his birthday than today. So 
Thank you. I just had to say Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Let's take our last two points as, as quickly as possible. Thank you. Yes. Hi. Good afternoon. My name is Chaplain Reddy, and um, I'm representing On a Mission. Um, I came from Long Island in my little sheltered life and came to New York City like right between the time when 9-11 had just happened, like a year later. So uh, I got an experience of New York that I had never knew in Long Island. But it wasn't a bad thing, and I'm, taking some, I'm saying this specifically because sometimes we think that everything that happens in life when it's bad, you know, we're just going down. But sometimes it will help you to, to springboard you, to push you, to rise you to up. So I moved into this apartment building in Washington Heights area, and I found out that my building formerly had been taken over by drug dealers, drug lords, and that it was so bad that the federal marshals had to take it over. But it was because of a tenant that lived in that building who took it upon himself to be daring and to be bold that the individuals, the federal marshals came in and kind of like rescued the tenants that were living in there. Once I got there and I had that information in my ear, it got me kind of concerned. I was like, I don't want to go back to what history used to be like. So when I started seeing things happening in my building, it got me to the point where I was like, no, 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 my name is Wes and I can't be in no mess. And I happened to be involved with security. So when I took myself over to the community board meeting, to the council over there to let them introduce themselves to me and who they were, and I introduced myself to them, I explained to them, I will begin to do a tenant association meeting and start letting you know what's going on, which I did. And when they got the earful of what was going on in the building, they, they, they pulled my management um, company to the carpet to come to the meeting and address some of these issues. Needless to say, they wanted to put me out the building because they had no idea that I was going to go over there and be that bold. But let me just say this. The reason why I'm saying this, Fannie Lou Hamer said, you got to be sick and tired of being sick and tired. I see what the officials have done. I see what this mother has been through. I see what this, this lawyer, this police officer, they have done their parts to make sure they put the SAFE Act in place, put the, the Community Civilian Review Board in place, but still things are being kind of like under the radar. But we as a community, you have to value what you value and make an investment in what you make an investment. Now, if you're gonna put more interest into Nike and to McDonald's and let the stuff that's going on around your neighborhood affect your children and don't be there when they need you, then things are gonna continue to remain the same. Police officers, like they said, aren't perfect, they aren't innocent, and they are human. But you have to take yourself to those community board meetings. I got to meet Adrian um, Espelot at the time when he was running in the, in the community council over there. That's how I got connected to denying that who's doing what and who do I go see. I started writing things down. I started speaking about it. And my voice, I'm like a David and Goliath. Sometimes you don't have to be a big, bad wolf. Just take the rock that God gives you and know how to throw it when it's time to throw it. And I thank you. And I'm willing to know for reform for 2015, where should we throw the rock so we can move forward? Nonviolently, of course. You. Our last point from the audience. Good afternoon. My name is Michelle Danvers Faust, and I'm the director of um, Bronx Community College Trio Pre Collegiate Program. So now I direct three federal grant programs. And Ms. Diallo, you know, you've seen me. Um, my concern, basically, this is a great panel, and I look across the room, we see college students, but my concern is reaching the pipeline. You know, we serve from middle schoolers all the way up to, you know, PhD. So my concern is, I know the panel is here, how do we get ac gain access to you for when we have our events on campus? I know, Ms. Diallo, you're having an event on the 14th on campus, which is critical for our youth, because 16 years ago, our kids don't really know who Amadou Diallo is. So I think it's so critical that we educate our kids. They're living through it now, but they can't look back in history because they just don't know. So, you know, I'm just reaching out to the panel and for everyone else in the audience, our youth needs us to educate them. You know, and sometimes it's hard for us to reach you and to get you to, you know, we're for fortunate to have you, Ms. Diallo. But it's hard to get speakers to come on campus to speak to our youth. Maybe the event may be too small, but it's important that we reach down to our kids because our kids do really amazing things that we can't even imagine. They do things that we don't even think they can do. 
And I think it's very important that we go back. The immediate history, I mean, we're living it, but to them, it's historical. So we need to make sure that they know what's going on. We need to make sure they know who Amidou Diallo is. They know who Eric Gardner is, but they need to make the connections. So all I'm just saying, my comment is, panel, Graham, I know I know you. I'm going to reach out to you guys because I want to bring you okay. to Bronx Community College to speak to my kids because it's important because ignorance breeds hostility. If you don't know the peaceful way of solving problems, then we're going to have a big problem because our youth need to know the peaceful way of solving our issues. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to ask um, our panelists just to take a minute. I'm sorry. I wanted to give everybody who wanted to speak an opportunity. So I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Weatherspoon, Mr. Siegel, Mrs. Diallo to speak, and then Mayor Dinkins will just come up and close us out, OK? Uh, I'll try and do this in 30 seconds. I'm just going to throw some quick bits out. Uh, we need to take the pressure off of police officers in terms of activity and productivity. If crime is at its lowest point that it's been in 50 years, then why are there so many interactions with the police? Crime cannot be down and you're interacting with people at the rate that you're interacting with people. If we had Barney of Mayberry here, that would not be a problem, would it? I, I think that it would be good if people could go about their lives and not having, not having negative interactions. So there's no justification for all of these stops and interactions with the police if crime is down. So somebody's lying about that. Also, in terms of uh, the young lady, is she still here? Um, She's there. I don't know if you've ever been on a, on a military installation, but before you were born, the police departments were nationalized. You just don't know it. Okay? We do a lot of work in conjunction with the federal government. The Joint Terrorist Task Force and other agencies that have been formed are pretty much involving NYPD members. Some of the guys that I've trained and my former partners. And what I'm getting to is this. If you can't come to the table and talk, dialogue, legislate, and bring about change, you're suicidal. Also, but there was an old statement, the revolution will not be televised. It will not be televised. The average person has no clue of what this government is capable of doing and will do with no recompense. And they don't care about whether you're white, black, Asian, or anything. They will do it, all right? The technology that you run around with, your social media, all of that, we've got you in our grasp already. We got you, all right? Your debit card, we got you. Everything that you have, we got you. It's not there for convenience. It's there so we can monitor you. And we don't even have to look for you because when you swipe that card, we know where you are. We know your buying and spending habits. We've got you, all right? You are not going to engage in a violent, disruptive manner. I had former Green Beret come to me outside of Amadou Diallo's house and tell me we are tired of this, just like you're saying. They're tired of it. And these are military personnel, and they're not shooting with a 9 millimeter. They're using a 30 caliber weapon, all right? They're tired of it. And I told them, I said, you know what the end result is, all right? So we're not, we're not looking to engage in that way. We have to use every peaceable means of bringing about change in the society so that our children, my, so that my grandchildren, who are now growing up, can live in peace. Thank you. Norman. Well, some of the things that Graham said that our government has the capacity to do, I'm against. And I think we should also well, try, it, we it. should try and not accept that the government has the right to do the things that you're talking about and try to convince them that that's not the way to go. When we read what we've done with regard on the international scene in Guantanamo Bay and you read those stories, I don't feel good about being an American when that happens. We should not be accepting that. To the woman who raised the question about revolution, I want to speak to you. Uh, I'm for revolution too, but nonviolence. The revolution of the nonviolent revolution of the Southern Civil Rights Movement, and I say Southern because we haven't had ours yet up here. And that's led by Dr. King, Southern Christian Leadership Conference, SNCC. Uh, I'm opposed to a revolution that is violent. I'm opposed and I do support what Eric said because when I saw the burning of those stores in Ferguson, I was opposed to that. I think tactically that's a mistake and I also think that that's not the way to go about to bring about change. Uh, I'll leave it at that. Mrs. Diallo. 
Yes, let me just quickly say, um, we have in the room uh, a, f a former uh, recipient of the Amadou Diallo Scholarship. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, please. <laughs> All right. Um, I have to say, we talked about many solutions today, but there's one thing that I want to make, one point. Whenever there is a shooting case involving uh, police office, uh, officers' bullets, you always, you can quickly read the stereotype of the victim, quickly. They will expose everything that they can dig and find, but you will never hear the past of the police officer who killed that person. Even if they have prior shootings, even if they're being uh, reprimanded, whatever they, is in their file will be protected. So that is a point you should not forget to mention whenever you talk about changes. And the other point I want to make is journalism. I thank Craig Wall for being here and talking about the stereotyping and digging. You even brought tears to my eyes. Thank you for the story that you just told. There is in this room another woman who have been victimized just like I was. Hawa Ba's sons, Mohammed Ba. The stereotyping against Mohammed Ba was wrong. Please, I need you, if anyone who is here who wants to do reporting and write about stories, good stories, talk to the mother and talk about, ask the mother who was Mohammed Ba. You will find out that it was a very nice, young, decent man whose father, in fact, was with Mr. Diallo, Amadou's father, in Liberia. His father was a millionaire. Amadou, when he was born, his father hired a small plane to come and see the baby. Mohammed Ba, when he was born, his father was multimillionaire. So he went to the best schools. Everybody have a story. Please, the stereotyping must end for humanity. And the young lady down there, quickly, I'm sorry I cannot finish telling everything, but I have to do this. We hear you. We know you are angry, rightly so. What you are doing is important because that will push, push politicians to come forward and address the issue. I agree with you, but as Norman said, the violence is not gonna solve the problem. Bring a proposal to any elected officials. Share with us what else do you think we are missing so that we can implement those changes. We want to tell you that you count. And all the millions of young men who rise up today count. We need your contribution, but in a positive way. Thank you. Well, this concludes our, our program. I want to thank you for being here. Uh, I hope that those of you who have heard things with which you disagree I hope that you will understand that at least the people here assembled are attempting to do something about it. And uh, there, there are places that you might go and make some of the points that have been made by those who say that we ought to have revolution. Well, uh, I'm fond of reminding people that Okay, M Mrs. Diallo reminds me that we want to thank all the volunteers who helped put this event together, and I couldn't agree more. The, uh, there are gatherings uh, at this university and all over town. There are community board meetings. There are elected officials who have uh, so-called uh, town hall meetings where some of you uh, might go and express your deep feelings uh, as opposed to uh, not, not you young lady but your, your colleague who disrupted this meeting we at least were trying to get something done uh, no but if, if, if he had stayed and, and addressed us as you did. He could have made the same points without interrupting Eric Adams. You know, I, uh, 
I served in the United States Marine Corps in 1945. There, there were no blacks in the Marine Corps prior to 42, and they later gave us a congressional gold medal for that service. And sometimes uh, people would ask me, particularly members of the press, would ask me about, about how, how things were. And I would remind them that I remember when in the South, we and Tuskegee Airmen were treated less well than were German and Italian prisoners of war. Uh, I, I remember those days. I, I know about Selma and, and the things that went on. And so when people say to me, well, how are things? I'll say, well, they're not yet what they need to be. But thank God they're not what they used to be. So I hope that uh, some of you, particularly you young people, would appreciate that it's the young folks who got things done. There were four young people who sat at the lunch counter uh, at a Woolworths from uh, AT&T, and, and uh, they knew they weren't going to get served, but they sat there. Uh, Rosa Parks knew that she was going to get uh, a hard time, but she said, I'm not going to move. And, and uh, one of my heroes is uh, the congressman uh, who walked across that bridge uh, from Lewis. Selma to Montgomery. John Lewis. John Lewis. John Lewis. I, I got to tell you, I, I, don't, I don't know who among us, including some of the, the most vehement, angry people who want revolution, I wonder who among us would have walked alongside him knowing you're going to get beat like hell every step of the way. Uh, so there, there's some of us, there's some of us who feel we have contributed in the past. We may not be doing all that you would wish now, but please understand that uh, it's not our fight alone. It's yours too. And, and Goodman, and, uh, Goodman, Cheney, and Schwerner. Yeah. Uh, we yeah. shouldn't forget, and people should know who Andrew Goodman is too. And I, that's a, another board on which I serve, the Andrew Goodman Foundation. Those uh, two Jews and a black uh, went to Mississippi, were buried in a shallow grave in Mississippi, trying to get the right to vote. Just to register to vote. And uh, so uh, I hope that, that I didn't expect that we would have this gathering today, and we would submit uh, plans where all the problems would be served, uh, solved. Well, I know that, and I know you know that. But for God's sake, if, if uh, your, your colleague who is gone, if he wants to disrupt a meeting, this ought not be the one he disrupts. You, uh, go someplace, damn it, where they're not helping at all. At least we're trying to get it done here. So thank you all for coming very much.